have you. Thank you for fellowshipping with us and, and it's just so good to get to worship with you all. Thank you for joining us on live stream as well. That's, uh, I haven't been outside in a little while. Is it cleared up out there at all? I don't know, when I was waking up going to church this morning, it was almost downright spooky, just with all the mist and fog. I was like, am I in a movie or something? But I'm just praising the Lord for the rain. We have finally got rain now. So glad we needed that. But I also know that means more mowing. So fortunately, there's some give and take there. But, well, we're going to start with some, some songs. And this first one is new. I want to teach this to you guys. I'm really excited about it. It's called There's Nothing That Our God Can't Do. And it's just a very exciting and bold song. One that we can sing with confidence about the power of the Lord and that everything is possible through Him. So let's all stand and sing.
next song we're going to sing. I really enjoy the message of this one because it's very simple. It's called, Here's My Heart. I just appreciate it because it's like, it's almost like the simple offering, you know, an offering of our hearts isn't something that's small. It takes a lot to give up our lives and our hearts to the Lord, but it sings, speak what is true. Here's my heart, speak what is true. And it's almost like, you know, you're just giving it up and getting out of the way. Because a lot of times it's just putting our pride to the side and letting God take over in our lives. So let's not sing this lightly, but it's easy. It's an easy one to sing with, and it's, it's really good. And let's just bring our hearts to the Lord. I think one thing that starts it off really well is this scripture in Psalm. It says, teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart, that I may fear your name. I will praise you. Lord my God, with all my heart, I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead.
Let's pray. Lord, we give this offering to you as we sing these words. I pray that we would mean it. We come to you in humility and to set everything else aside. Let's let you take control. And we give our hearts and our lives to you. And you be glorified at the focus. I pray that you be with Heath as he brings a message. Speak your truth through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Fish Out of Water, part four. We are wrapping up our series talking about creation and evolution. This is the final message, and we have unpacked a lot in this series. You could go back and watch. Uh, thankful for those that are watching on, on live stream right now. Uh, we do have uh, live event notes. You can go back. Uh, each one are available. The sermons are available on the app, Woodland-AR, if you want to catch up. We've covered a lot of ground, and today I'm going to cover the most ground. So I'm going to have to do you today like the old country preacher said. Just open up your Bible anywhere, and I'll be by there directly. <laughs> um, and how come all the country preachers, did they go to training to go biblically, spiritually, numerically? I mean, somehow it's just a bravado that they do. But anyway, so... Open up your Bibles. We're going to go from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 9. Fish out of water. Genesis chapter 9. Last week, we touched on the global flood. The global flood. Noah's flood changed everything. The atmosphere, the continents, everything changed after the flood. It was a worldwide cataclysmic event and in Genesis chapter 9, God is promising Noah and all of us that he is never going to destroy the world again with water. And we're going to unpack that. Genesis chapter 9. And we're going to look at verse 1, but, but remember there's no chapter breaks in the original uh, manuscript. So the last verse of chapter 8 is really powerful because God is saying, listen, I, God is the one who destroyed the earth with a flood. He destroyed his own creation. And then he reminds Noah and us that in verse 22 of chapter 8, it says, as long as the earth endures, seed time, harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So this idea that humans are going to change the climate and ruin the world, relax. God is going to be the one who ruins the world, not us. We, we you know, so just, just relax. There's no doomsday because of us. The doomsday is going to be coming because of God himself. So he says, as long as the earth endures, this climate is always going to be changing, but there will be cycles and it will last until God says it's done. Okay, so that was for anybody who likes Al Gore. Anyway, all right. So look at verse 1, okay? Verse 1 of chapter 9. Then God blessed Noah... And his sons, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. This is very important to remember that God says, Noah, 
your sons, your family, I want you to increase, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. What was the command for Adam and Eve? It was to be fruitful, be multiply and have dominion over the earth. Human beings were created in the beginning perfect and intelligent and to have dominion over the animals, over all of creation. They were to take God's natural resources and use everything that was around them. That is how, why God gave us the creation. We're human beings to have dominion over it. Now, because everything changed after the flood, look at chapter 9, look at verse 2. The fear and the dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea, they are given into your hands. Now, everything changed after the flood. Every living thing changed before everything, the animals, there was a, there was a good relationship in the beginning between man and animals. Remember, there was no death in God's original creation. There's no survival of the fittest. There's no chaos and disease and all of this swirling destruction going on for millions of years. It's created perfect. It's created flawless. But then now, be after the flood, he says, the fear and dread of you will fall on the beasts of the earth. Remember that God created Adam and Eve to, to be over the animals, and the animals would come to them. Could you imagine pet petting wild animals that weren't really wild because you wouldn't have to worry about them ripping out your jugular? Could you Im imagine having these creatures come up to you and you tell them what to do? I mean, it would be, wow, this is some kind of power. These beasts of the field are, are for us, and we, we have a relationship. You know, we, we're able to... to to have them around, there, it would be a glorious thing. But now because of sin and now after the flood, the relationship between man and animals is going to be very different. The fear and dread is going to come upon you over the animals. And I think we can turn that cat around and say that the animals over man. There's going to be this relationship that is going to be violent. There's going to be a fear. So keep that in mind as we unpack, unpack the scripture this morning. So, look in verse 3. Every living thing that moves about will be food for you. Just as I have given you the green plants, I now give you everything. Remember, in God's creation, there was, no, there was nobody shooting any deer to begin with. There was nobody going out and killing something so they could eat. Remember, it was salad, it was fruits, it was veggies, it was bare. I mean, this was all the plants but now, God tells Noah, he says, before it was all of that, but now he says, I give you everything. And all the carnivores said, okay, only three meat eaters here, okay. All right, so let me talk to the vegans here. Now, we, we can eat meat. We can eat meat. Here it is. This is before the law and before the restrictions of clean and unclean. But understand, I give you everything. Because remember, the flood changed everything. Now, he says this in verse 4, but you must not eat meat that has lifeblood still in it. And then he says, for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an account for the life of another human being. God is laying down the groundwork. He says, whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed for the in, in the image of God. He, God has made mankind. Remember, before the flood, the earth was filled with violence and people's thoughts were only evil continually. So the Netflix queue back then was all dark and evil and murder and violence and mayhem. Now, and then God says, listen, whoever sheds human blood, his blood will be shed. So God lays down capital punishment right there. If you have a problem with it, then you and God need to talk about it. Don't, don't come at me. Because life is precious. If someone premeditates and kills someone, their blood is to be shed. 
Life is a gift. It is precious. Now look at verse 7. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number and multiply on the earth and increase upon it. That is very important to remember. This is the word of God to say, hey, multiply, spread out, fill the earth. That was, that was what he told them to do. But we're going to see that's not what people did here in just a little bit. So, Understand this now. The rest of that chapter, it talks about God reminding Noah and, the, and what he does to remind them that he will never flood the earth again is he gives a rainbow and then Skittles fell from the sky. No, that would be my, that would be my version because I like Skittles. But anyway, so he gives a rainbow. So what does this tell us? That before the flood, probably no one had seen a rainbow because... That would be the sign? Well, I've seen that before, man. Don't give me that. There had to be no rainbow before the flood. What happened? The flood. There was cataclysmic, atmospheric, geographical, continent shifting. Remember the flood? The earth splits apart. We're talking hundreds, possibly thousands of volcanoes that are erupting the magna from underneath the crust of the earth, heating up the oceans. And when oceans get hot, there's evaporation. And that goes up into the atmosphere where we have cold and climate. We have crazy things going on. We have ash and soot everywhere. We have the whole earth changing and it says the heavens it rained down there was no rain before the flood we found that last week so a lot of christian scholars have believed that something happened changed in the atmosphere that would now after the flood would allow the ultraviolet rays to penetrate through so we could see roy g biv remember that in school kids are like who's that Red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, and violet. That was the sign. The sign of the rainbow was God says, I'm never going to cataclysmically destroy the earth in this way. He's going to destroy it in another way. With fire, not with water. And he promised that he would never do that again. And so you can read that in the rest of that chapter. And so he establishes the covenant between them. But then I want you to skip over to chapter 11 because this is, remember the edict is everyone spread out and fill the earth. Now, as you turn to chapter 11, before we get into that, I want, to under, I want you to understand it, there, is a, there is a huge, huge ice age. Scientists have tell, told us that there's an ice age. Now, they tell us there's, you know, multiple ones. But we know there was an ice age. Because in Job chapter 38, look at this. In Job chapter 38, it tells us. God says, from whom's womb did the ice come from? And who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. So how would Job, living in the Middle East, know about ice and about how something, the waters could be frozen? I mean, it'd be one thing to see, you know, a little snow on the mountaintop. It's another thing for him to talk about frost and where is this ice coming from and, and the waters becoming hard like stone. The global flood changed everything. It changed the continents. It's in, and there was ice. With all of that moisture in the air, the sun would have, the temperature would have gone way down and all of the, all of the oceans that had gotten warm, it would have been snowing and it would have created all of this ice. Now keep in mind, with the ice, that means the water in the oceans would be a whole lot less. So there could be land bridges. The water levels we have today were different after the flood, and we're talking hundreds of years of ice and, and this moisture. And for you science geeks, you know, ice is like magnetized. It has a weird uh, thing to it. And that's why the polar caps, because they're magnetized, and I don't understand this, but I've read it, but that's why the, that's why the snow is there. That's why it's up at, up at the caps. God didn't create it like that in the beginning because everything was perfect and tropical. But after the flood, everything changed. So, there, so people could spread out and move around. How did the kangaroos get to Australia? Okay, they're stoner. 
you understand there was an ice age, the water would have been deeper. All the bad guys are stoners in my stories, okay? So anyway, because they're usually thinking they're smarter than everybody, right? Doing drugs, smarter. Hmm, okay. Now, so understand that when ever God is telling them to spread out, that is his plan, is to disperse. Now, I want you to look in chapter 11. Now, the whole world had one language and a common speech. So Noah and his family and the animals get off, and we're talking possibly the Septuagint has this event. This is called the Tower of Babel, and, and this event is likely a millennium away from the flood. By the way, when you hear that thunder, could you imagine Noah? After, I mean, he was in the ark. Remember when the earth split apart, and we're, we're talking about the massive. Could you, remember, could you imagine the PTSD that cat would have? The next time he heard a thunderstorm, but then he could, he could see the rainbow. Go, okay, okay, God, you're not going to kill us. I mean, when you hear that, it, it's like, it, it, it's a rumble. So this is a reminder. But now, so look at this in, in chapter 11, verse 1. The whole world had one language and a common speech. Now, God created human beings with a language. There was one language. How could language evolve how could you possibly have any kind of communication with anybody? How could you understand? How could that slowly evolve? How could you understand anything without all the letters of the alphabet? Playing will of fortune with no vowels, no consonants? How did this happen? I read an article, scientists are unsure of how language evolved. You think? Because it can evolve. Evolution makes perfect sense if you don't think about it. How could you, eh, buh, good day, eh, buh, good day, eh, buh, good day, eh, buh, good day. <laughs> how, how could you even know what that means unless there's some intellect, there's some language that all comes together. You have to have everything together. You can't add parts. Otherwise, you could never get somewhere I'm, I'm getting old. I'm getting some timers. I can't remember some of the time. And I'll start a sentence, and it's like, my kids are like, Dad, are you going to finish your sentence? I'm like, uh, oh, yeah. I got, you know, you got to have it all together for you to make sense. So understand that, that the language is a gift. How have we evolved into predicate nominatives and dangling participles? What are those? Language is so complex. Now, we're going to see where all the languages come from in just a moment. But there's one language, and everybody understood it, and they communicated, because that's what makes humans different than animals. Animals communicate, but they don't have a language to express ideas and spiritual things. That's the difference. Now, look at this. In verse 2, it says, as people moved eastward. Now, in the Septuagint, which is a much more accurate translation of the Old Testament, it says from, they moved from the east. Now remember, the, the ark landed somewhere in the mountains of Ararat. And so as they are traveling, as people, we're talking a thousand years later possibly, there's a lot of people, and they have multiplied because you didn't have to wait to get through college and get through done video, playing video games to have married and get kids. So uh, you know, things happen a lot sooner without YouTube. And so now you've got a bunch of people on the planet, and they're coming look what happens in verse 3 it says they said to each other come let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar and then they said come let's build a, a ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth now Chapter 10 tells us who got all these people together. His name was Nimrod. And what mom names her kid Nimrod, I don't know. But anyway, his name means let us revolt. He was a mighty hunter. And I don't think it was talking about venison. He was, he's a hunter of souls. He's bringing people together. Now remember, what did God clearly say? Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. I want you to spread around the earth. 
so that you will rely upon me and so that you will look to me. But Nimrod, being the first true antichrist to try to bring everybody together, here's what he says. He says, let's build ourselves a city. Let's, let's, we need to protect ourselves from maybe any other calamity and let's come together. Could they have had a fear that maybe there would be another flood? Possibly. They wanted to unite everybody. They wanted to build a city and make a name for themselves. Guys, this is humanity organizing themselves in rebellion against the Lord. The Lord clearly gave a command and it was passed on that, hey, we're to spread out. And then this guy says, no, we need to all come together. That's what we need to do. Otherwise, we may be spread out over the whole earth, so we need to come together. This was the birthplace of humanism. This is the idea where human beings are going to defy God and his word and they are going to have a better plan. The name Babel means the gate of God, the gateway to God. So human beings at the Tower of Babel are thinking they're gonna provide a spiritual enlightenment way for all of us to come together. And everybody thought it was a great idea. And they probably had Jefferson Starship there to say, we built this city. Okay, anyway, they built that city on pride and their rock and roll because they wanted to everybody come together. Now, so it says, let's make a name for ourselves. We want to make it about us. This is for your protection and security. And let's unite now look what happens in verse five. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. Now when you read something like that in your Bible, that doesn't mean God was like not aware of it. It's an anthropomorphism. It's a huge word to simply mean descri describing God in human terms. The Lord is omniscient. He didn't have to wake up and come down and go, hey, what's going on? It says the Lord came down to see. It's just a way for you to understand that when the Lord is getting ready to do something, it wasn't like he goes, oh, where are they? Oh, here they are. Oh, that's a big tower you got there. Right. It says, the Lord came down to see the tower, a way of him. And then the Lord said, if as one people, look at verse 6, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be, be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So humanity organizes a rebellion, uh, to, brings everybody together, and then the Lord in the Holy Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit say, let's go down and let's confuse their language. Because if we don't, they are going to, the rebellion is going to grow and so the Lord goes down. Now look at the next verse. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. And that is why it is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The word, and our word Babel means what? Confusion. So if you're babbling on, you're babbling you're, con you're like not making sense. So the very word means confusion. God changed it. Here are they thinking they're going to bring clarity, and yet God brings confusion. How do we have all the different languages in the world? Right there, ladies and gentlemen. Because how can language evolve? It can't. How can we go from one common language to however many languages we have now? And so God confused their language. So here they are working all together and then one day all of a sudden you go into work and you turn to the foreman and he says, See, da, 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 da. and you look at him like, dude, what's in your coffee? And he says something very similar and you, you're freaking out. I mean, then you go to somebody else and they have some other weird syllables in, and you're like, and you're tripping. And then you, then you go and finally find somebody that you can understand and you're so relieved. And then you start to find, maybe there's some others. So, so what God did, and I can't wait to see the DVD when we get on the other side and to see if I'm right. 
uh, how this unpacked it. I mean, they're coming, they're working together. Hey, man, hand me that hammer. And, they, and you can't understand them. They're looking at each other. So all these different people groups, I don't know how many, but they had to split up until they could understand each other. And then they huddled together because that would trip everybody out. Because everybody, it'd be like a nightmare. I mean, and, and think about this. How, how could language evolve? How could you have an apprentice if you could never finish your sentence? How, how could you do anything? How could civilization evolve and grow? How could humans be able to have dominion and grow if they never got to finish their sentence? Hey, son, I want you to go over there and get... Uh, um, Dad, are you going to finish your sentence? Well, you know. No, I don't know. How, how is this going to work? See, remember, evolution makes perfect sense if you don't think about it. We got all of these languages, and God creates the different languages right here at the Tower of Babel. And how do we have all the different nationalities, ethnicities? The world calls them races, right? The different races are, have their root and traces in the book of Genesis. In fact, Paul tells us in Acts chapter 17, he says this, that through one man, through one man, through one blood, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings. So from one man, that is Adam, now here we are through Noah, through one man, all of the nations of the earth have come from. And that's what science figures out. It started with two people. Shocker. Not a rock. Two people have reproduced, and now all of these kinds. So you say, well, where are all these? How did this happen? Well, after the flood, there's, there's a lot of movement over centuries and as people would move and fill the earth, people that went north, because the climate was a little different, their skin didn't need to be as dark to absorb the heat, so they're lighter, and their skin is lighter, their hair is lighter, and they're named Olga and Holda and Tolof. And so they go up to Scandinavia, and so you have different people, and they reproduce, and they're light-skinned, and they have light complexions, and then people that traveled south towards the equator where it's hotter, and they're, over time, their pigmentation got darker, improvising with the environment, which is something science proves. Small changes within the species happened over time. And so they reproduce and their skin got darker. And then some people moved to the east and their skin was a little different over time in the climate where they are. And some people's eyes got round and some people's got slanted. And over time, they reproduce and now we have all the different races, but they all come from one man. There's your genealogy, folks. And it's all right here in your Bible. We didn't come from orangutans, chimpanzees, and gorillas. Or anything in between. All the people on the earth have come from one man. And they're all scattered through the earth because God saw it that way. And he scattered them over the face of the earth. Now I want you to pause right there. Now we're going to go into even more history. The Bible's history, but I'm going to give you some extra biblical sources today. What happened to all the people after the ark? Well, we just learned that God gives them different languages, so it creates different cultures and different things over time, and then all the animals that were on the ark were to be fruitful and multiply. And what happened to the dinosaurs? I'm glad you asked, because we know there's probably about 28 different kinds of dinosaurs and if they're on the ark, which they were because every, two of every living land animal was on the ark, they would reproduce. Now, throughout history, we have had people document dragons. They didn't have the word dinosaur. That's why it's not in the Bible because it wasn't invented until 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. We have the word dragons, serpents. All throughout history, people have documented seeing something. Now, so I'm going to share with you one of the most famous explorers of all time that you probably learned about in your swimming pool. Marco. Thank you. Marco Polo. It's not just a, a kitty game. 
This guy was an actual explorer. And when he went to India, this is a lengthy quote. Stay with me. Read it with me. This is from his book 2, chapter 40 in his travels. Leaving the city of Yaqui and traveling 10 days in a westerly direction, you reach the province of Karazan, which is also the name of the chief city. Here are seen huge serpents, 10 paces in length and about 30 feet, and 10 spans, about 8 feet, girth of the body. At the forepart, near the head, they have two short legs, having three claws like those of a tiger, with eyes larger than a four-penny loaf, however big that is, and very glaring. The jaws are wide enough to swallow a man. The teeth are large and sharp, and their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. Others are met with a smaller size, being eight, six, or five paces long, and the following method is used for taking them. In the daytime, by reason of the great heat, they lurk in caverns. From whence at night, they seek their food, and whenever beast that, whatever beast they meet, whether, whether they seek their food, whether they can lay hold of their tiger, the wolf, or any other, they devour. After which, they drag themselves towards some lake, spring of water, or river in order to drink. And by their motion in this way along the shore and their vast weight, they make a deep impression as, it, as if a heavy beam had been drawn along the sands. Those whose employment is to hunt them and observe the track by which they are most frequently accustomed to go, and they fix into the ground several pieces of wood armed with sharp iron spikes, which they cover with sand in such a manner as not to be perceptible. When the animals make their way towards the places they usually haunt, they are wounded by these instruments and speedily killed. The crows, as soon as they perceive them to be dead, set up to scream, and this serves as a signal to the hunters who advance the spot and proceed to separate the skin from the flesh, taking care immediately to secure the gall, which is highly esteemed in medicine. The flesh also of the animal is sold at a dear rate, being thought to have a higher flavor than other kinds of meat, and by all persons, it's esteemed a delicacy. You can read that in the travels of Marco Polo, and he's writing this down, and he's documenting what happened. Now, in your mind, as you, as you read that, what, what kind of critter could he be thinking of? Could it be? It sounds like a T-Rex to me. Two short arms with three claws and w jaws wide enough to swallow a man. How come it, has anybody read this? Have you heard this before? Raise your hand. This is not in our history books. This isn't in the science books. Because no man has seen a living dinosaur. How about Marco Polo? He wrote it down. Nobody's messing with this thing. And then they kill it and eat it. And so why are there not very many? Because people killed them and ate them and it tasted good because God gave the animals for food. So the brontosaurus burgers, burger is real. <laughs> Son, what do you want on your brontosaurus burger? <laughs> they, they loved it and you had a lot of meat. You could make money, so they killed these things. It makes perfect sense. Man and dinosaurs have always lived together. Terrible lizards. We have it documented in history. How many of you have heard of Beowulf? I know. It's, it's, it's just a few of you. Other you think, is that a video game? This guy lived in history. The epic poem of Beowulf. It is a long, epic poem. Way before Bill and Ted got there. It's epic. And so this thing is, is about Beowulf, and he goes to kill this monster. The monster's name is Grendel. Now, the monster in Beowulf is described as a dragon, a water monster. The word that they used, I want to make sure I get this right. This is the 6th century. Uh, Grendel is the name of the monster. Now, some people go, well, you know, 
They just named it like you name your dog Fido. Well, Grindel, that word is where we get our word grind. This thing would grind things. It howled. It, it destroyed. It was angry. Everyone feared Grindel. And uh, it wasn't some hairy troll that, that people have kind of created. This was a real deal. And in fact, the, the old European English way was saying they called it a knucker. Okay? A knucker. And that, that knucker, that word, is how they used it. It comes from the old English word nikor, which means water monster. And get this, they, had, they said the knuckers lived in the knucker holes. Well, imagine that. The knuckers live in the knucker holes. What were the knucker holes? They were this swampy area. That the, that's where they lived. And people were afraid of them. And in fact, many dignitaries and governments would pay somebody to go and kill the water monster. The dragon. And then you'd go kill this thing and get, ta- get the da- king of the daughter and a tax-free uh, exemption. Yeah, who would what, live with tax-free? Merit, get, get into the royal family? Kill this thing that everybody has been, it terrorizes everything. So uh, in Beowulf, it unpacks this story and he goes in and in the story of Beowulf, he, he, gets, he travels over there, he gets under the arm of one of these creatures and he tucks himself underneath the jaw and rips one of the little arms off. Could it be a Spinosaurus? This thing that would live in the water and come out and pale wolf is able to get underneath the jaw where this critter can't get him and he cuts or rips one of the arms off. This thing goes and bleeds to death. And he's, he's heralded as a hero. You can read, this is in history. It's amazing. You can read about people in England, in Sussex, England, that were talking about flying reptiles Could it be a pterodon? They talk about this thing coming over the village and and terrorizing people. That would be terrifying, wouldn't it? I don't like bats. We had one in my Bible study last Tuesday, and this thing came in, and I ducked, and I grabbed my neck for some reason. (laughs) What am I doing? Brainwashed by Hollywood? Oh, This thing flies in and we're all kind of freaking out. All these grown men are like, whoa. Imagine that thing flying in, picking up one of your sheep or one of your kids. Everybody would want, there'd be a huge bounty on one of these bad boys. So understand the the flying serpents. We have had, there are stones. Look at these stones. These are from Peru or Inca. Look at this. I mean, did somebody take some acid? and then chip these out, what does that look like to you? That to me looks like dinosaurs, does it not? Look at this next one, this one guy's riding one. That's a triceratops. Why isn't that in the history books? I'm gonna turn into Steve Martin. What in the world? How come nobody talks about this? Because it goes against the narrative that we don't need a God who created us. We're evolved over millions of years. Don't question it. Hush up. You're crazy if you believe dinosaurs live with man. Somebody needs to explain all this stuff. Oh, it just grinds my gears. Even, look at this. This is a petroglyph. This is an ancient Facebook status update. Now look at the, look at the giant creature in the middle and look how many Hunters are around him. Don't tell me that's an antelope. Don't tell me that that's a d- giraffe. Look, look, look at that big, look at the long tail. Look at the huge body. Looks like a sauropod to me. Oh, you're a nut job if you believe in dinosaurs and human beings living together. The word of God gives it to us in Job chapter 40 and then we see it throughout history. I'm getting worked up. Now, <laughs> look at this. I, I mean, when I present evidence in people, you know why? Because it's a spiritual battle. People are, do not want the truth. They want their own truth. That's, that's really what Babel is all about. It's mankind wants their own truth and they're going to believe that rain fell on the rocks for millions of years and slowly created life. That's what you believe? 
if you believe in evolution, that's what you believe, that we all came from a rock. It's crazy. But, but we have to believe that because we can't believe that God has his word and it can be trusted because then we're going to have to give an account. And nobody wants to do that. We need to all come together and we can be our own gods. Now in Revelation chapter 17, 5, I have this for you. Revelation is mentioned, I think, 287 times in the Bible. It starts in Genesis 11. And then it all throughout scripture, we have an empire of Babylon. And then in the end, in Revelation, it talks about a revived Babylonian empire. And it says in Revelation 17, verse 5, a mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. What in tarnation is going on there, right? Babylon, the great mother of all prostitutes. Babylon is a symbol of humanity's organization of rebellion against the Lord, uniting together against God, and we're going to do our own thing and have our own religion, and we're going to basically be our own gods. That's what Babylon is all about. It's humanity rebelling against God, plain and simple. I found this quote. This is, this is the epitome. This is the obscenity that Babylon is about it says this, spirituality is recognizing the divine light that is within us all. It doesn't belong to any particular religion. It belongs to everyone. We all have the same God. It doesn't matter whether you're Muslim or Christian or Jew. When you believe in God, whether you believe in God or not, you should believe that all people are part of one spiritual family. Now, if you agree with that statement, you are in the church of Babylon you are, you've been sucked in and seduced by this idea that we all are spiritual and we all need to come together and the world would be one big happy place if we would drop all of our differences. You have been brainwashed to believe that through your pop idols, through Hollywood, through the culture, through, through anybody that, that just wants to bring everybody together. That's what Babylon is. Nimrod was a type of antichrist trying to save the world, save everyone. That people think that's going to save us, that if we all come together. But when you read Revelation, you see that God judges Babylon and destroys them by fire. I mean, you could attach anybody, and those are in quotes, and that is a quote from someone, and you could probably pick your, a celebrity some person you really look up to that you think super smart and they're so together. I mean, that could, that, could, that could apply to almost anybody. That's actually from Muhammad Ali in 2004. Not, not a very good Muslim, not following the Quran there, Muhammad. The, the epitome of arrogance is to think that you can be your own God. You just totally dissed God and his word and his precious son that was sent to die to purchase your sin. That's the greatest obscenity. You know what the greatest evil is that has ever existed? It's not climate change. It's that the Son of God was murdered. The most innocent, perfect person ever was murdered and treated like the worst criminal that's ever lived. That is the greatest evil. That should be your social injustice that you are upset about. Because this perfect person died, but he willingly gave his life. But see, God is in sovereign control of all the evil in the world, and he uses it for his purpose. In fact, I want you to know this. God is not the author of evil, but he certainly authorizes it. God is not the author of evil, but he authorizes it for his own glory. It's called theodicy. You can study it. It'll, it'll blow you away. God didn't invent it. But it does, it has come into existence and then he authorizes it for his own glory. I want to I close in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter one. Paul writes this, talking about God, talking about salvation. He says, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered us with kindness 
on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. Do you see that? This is not just some spiritual experience. At the right time, according to God's sovereign plan, his mysterious secret, his sacred secret, which is revealed all throughout Scripture and all throughout history, is going to one day be revealed and it's going to be unveiled for the world to see at just the right time. God is going to bring everything under the control of Jesus. And he's going to rule and reign as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if you're not excited about that day, if that doesn't stir your heart, you very well could be a member of the Church of Babylon, thinking that we're going to fix the planet? We can come together and save ourselves? Are you kidding me? We're gonna somehow advance and evolve through technology and AI? Have we watched any Hollywood movies? What happens with AI? You think we're going to be able to somehow get to a utopia? That's the spirit of Babylon. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. And the spirit of the Antichrist is to bring everybody together and unite under love and kindness. That is not the biblical message. Jesus came to divide people. The real Jesus is not a uniter, folks. He's a divider. And you think, well, how can that be? It's in the scripture. This idea of love and peace and kindness and, and cold play, bringing everybody together and we have the hearts and the love and the peace and you pick your, any other pop favorite band, making everybody feel like they're one, that's the spirit of the Antichrist. There's no gospel message in that. There's a judgment day coming. The Bible says God is going to destroy Babylon with fire. That's, this is not some metaphorical thing. This is really going to happen. And we should long for that day. And it's my job to preach to you the word of God, that you can trust this book, that what's revealed in it is God's sacred secret, and it's revealed. And this is the message of life and salvation. Not man's ideas. They're, they're crazy. Organized against God. Are you ready for his return? Are you ready for him to take over? Does the evil and the, and the corruption and the chaos around you, does it, does it make you long for Christ to appear? It should, if you belong to him. If not, you need to belong to him by repenting of your sin, getting out of the church of Babel, leaving all of your friends who think everybody's spiritual and we're all going to the same place, and you follow Jesus. You follow him to that cross because he gave his blood to die in your place, the death that you deserve from a holy God. And he was raised to life so that you could be saved. I ran into a kid that I had pastored years ago, had his Deadpool shirt on, and I was like, hey man, good to, I hadn't seen him in forever. And he introduced me to somebody there at the store. Hey, this is my pastor when I used to be a good Christian. He goes, now I'm into Satanism. I said, well, then let, me, let me first clear something up. You were never a good Christian because there's no such thing. And now he tells me what he's into. And it broke my heart. Raised up in church, I don't know how many sermons he heard from me. And he's out there. I couldn't reason with him. I don't even know if there is a God. Well, why do you believe in Satan if you don't believe in God, if you're not sure? Why would you even go there? I mean, it was so, he gave me so many conflicting statements, I thought I was Alice in Wonderland. I mean, like, you're, just, you're making no sense. I said, here's the basis of it. You want to be your own God. You want to be your own God. That is why you've rejected it, plain and simple. I said, the Bible is history. It's archaeologically proven. There's eyewitness accounts. Jesus has been raised from the dead, and there's 
myriad of people that have testified that he's changed their life. And I said, he's changed my life. And then the lady behind the counter was like, he's changed my life too. I was like, mm. we had two witnesses. <laughs> but he rejects it. The same reason I did before I got saved. I wanted to do my own thing. And so do you. Don't create your own God. You'll be destroyed by the true God if you do that. Trust in his son, Jesus. He's the only way to be saved. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. God, it blows us away as we get into you, your word, how, how your Holy Spirit just illuminates our hearts, how it stirs us to know you more. And God, revealing the darkness and the lies that, are, that we tell ourselves, the lies that are in our culture. Lord, your word tells us the devil masquerades as an angel of light giving people false hope, false salvation. But God, you came to set us free. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit is revealing truth and dividing people so that the light is separated from the darkness. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Heath, for another great message and a great series. If you missed any of the series and want to catch up, you can go online at woodlandpeople.church or you can go on the app and download the app. If you've not, 4,700 people have done so. Join in the group. You can find it in the app store at woodland-ar and download that and you can get messages, announcements, and all kinds of things there. How many have, have learned something in this series? How many of you have questions now that you've heard this series? Go ahead, raise your hands. It's not embarrassing. Get those ready because Q&A Live is coming next month. So beginning next Sunday, Pastor Heath will take your questions and answer them live up, up front here. So be prepared to text them in and uh, during worship. And it's, it's, a, it's a great series. So we look forward to that beginning, beginning next week. It's time now for our offering period. We have so many things that are going on here at Woodland, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful place. But it's because we have people like you who are so giving and so loving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And that's what you guys are, you're cheerful givers. So we invite you to do that. You can do so online through the app, or if you prefer to give cash or check, please do that at the back doors as you leave. Gentlemen will be standing there with baskets to help you out with that. If you're visiting with us this morning, we want to welcome you, and we invite you to tear off the tear-off section of the bulletin, give us a little information about you, and put that in the baskets as you leave this morning. That way we have a record of your visit. Or if you would prefer, go online, let us know you were there, and we'll get that message. We're not going to fill up your mailbox. We just want a record that you were here. Two more announcements before we dismiss this morning. Very important. Parents, if your kids are going to camp this week, and your child needs a ride to ride with the group going from the church building, please see Debbie Tepper this morning before you leave. So if your child needs a ride in the morning, please see Debbie Tepper before you leave. She needs to get a correct count so we know how to make arrangements for that. And we would appreciate that. Also, no activities this week on Wednesday nor next week. We hope you enjoy some time with your families as we wrap up the summer. And we'll get everything going again later in the month of August. Got a big, big fall plan, so we hope you'll be a part of it. Again, thanks for being here this morning. If you're worshiping with us online, we're glad you did so. We invite you to come back and worship with us anytime you have the chance. Have a great week. God bless you. You're dismissed.